Marcus Gardley, thank you for this conversation. Thank you. It's such an honor to be here. Yours is a creative voice that echoes old souls. Would that be an accurate observation of you and your work? You know, I'm often called an old soul. I mean, even, even as a child, people just say, you know, you're an old soul. And I think that has a lot to do with the, the day that I was born, my father's grandmother passed. And so I think people in my family felt like I had her spirit. And, uh, and that's, that began my love and admiration for African-American women. And so most of my plays deal with the stories of African-American women. You've already won my heart expressing your love for African-American women. What does it feel like in your own words? It feels like doing this craft and, and, and being an artist and being connected and writing for African-American women feels like an honor. I, as a playwright, when I first started out, I was the plays mostly dealt with African-American men. And, but when we would have auditions for the roles of African-American women, these actresses would come in and they were incredible. And I said, there's not enough roles for these women. And so now I've just dedicated my work to you know, providing roles for them and telling the stories of the women that raised me. Oh, I love that. Your name is mentioned in the pantheon of James Baldwin, Tennessee Williams, August Wilson, among others. In the company of great playwrights, do you find the comparison daunting or comfortable? I always take it as a big compliment when people compare me to the greats, James Baldwin, Tennessee Williams, August Wilson, Toni Morrison. Um, I grew up reading books. You know, I was an avid reader. You know, kids would be playing outside, playing baseball. I had a book that was turning the pages. And so that, that upbringing, my mother was an avid reader and she really instilled in us a love for literature. And so that upbringing really, I think, inspired me to become a writer. And I feel like as African-American people, we have so many stories that need to be told. And I just want to be part of that canon. Well, let's talk about your body of work for which you are acclaimed, particularly this piece, The House That Will Not Stand. Take us into this play. The House That Will Not Stand is a play about free women of color in New Orleans in 1836. And the core of the story centers around a mother who's raising her three daughters. And the mother was became wealthy. She's actually the wealthiest African-American woman in New Orleans at the time. And she became wealthy through this system of plissage, which is a common law marriage between African-American women and white men. And so she became very famous through this system, but she now rejects the system because she realized it's a form of slavery. And so she doesn't want her daughters to adopt the system, but they become in love with it themselves. So she's trying to keep them in the house and instill them a sense of their own freedom. And she's trying to tell them that they, their bodies have no value, they're priceless. And so because, so it's, it's a conflict of interest because they're saying, Mom, but you was, became well known through this system. And, um, and so I won't tell the end, but it's, it gets real dramatic. <laughs> I'll put it that way. In doing the research and preparing for this, it took you to New Orleans. Mm -hmm. What did you find to be most shocking about the system and the city of New Orleans? So all the research that I did about New Orleans to write this play, what I found most shocking was that these African-American women were also civil rights activists. So the foundation of the civil rights movement started with these women. Um, a lot of them were active in the political arena during the time. Um, because they own a property, they said, well, if we own the property, we're going to have some say in some of the laws that happen, you know, in the city. And so they were a force to be reckoned with. Um, many people know Marie Laveau. She was also very influential during this time. And you didn't mess with Marie Laveau. And, um, and so uh, what's really fascinating is Plessy V.S. Ferguson, the civil rights case, actually found its roots through these women. So Plessy was a free man of color, and his, the, his matriarchy, or the women that raised him, were these women. And so you find all the roots, or many of the roots of the civil rights movement through these free people of color, through these women primarily, who were instilled in their children a sense of civil duty uh, to be involved in, in civil politics. That is just amazing history for even me, a person born and raised in Louisiana. This project was cultivated at Berkeley Rep through their new work, or their ground floor new work project. Once it started to have flesh on the bone, what did you see it as? Did you see it as what you started out for it to be? Did it take on a life of itself? What did this work become? So this play was commissioned by the Berkeley Rep, and it went through a nurturing process through the ground floor, which is their new development uh, program. And so I think when I fought the first draft, uh, 
to, to the Berkeley during the summer to workshop it. It was, you know, all the roots were there, all of the basic elements were there. But when I had the beautiful advantage of having the actors in the room and these African-American women who had life experience and some of the stories about their own families they told me, I was really inspired and I felt like I had a mission to really delve into the lives of these women and to tell the complete truth and also expose the beautiful relationship between mothers and daughters, which we often don't see. And also show um, how in generations, even if we don't agree, how it's often necessary to come to a compromise so that we all can move forward. Did the truth of this particular story frighten you? Did it unnerve you? Did it make you see parts of life in a way that you had not before? So doing research about this play really did unnerve me. I felt like, you know, these um, free people of color had slaves. And so I said, well, I'm going to write a story about black people that have slaves. I said, mm, no, I don't know. And then there's the voices from this period kept speaking to me and it said you have to tell this truth there's so many complexity and so so much um about this history that we don't know and people need to know and so what was beautiful about these these african-american people is that they actually were freeing their slaves they actually created an indentured servitude system in which you could buy your freedom and so it's at one point yeah it's you know problematic to own slaves period but it's really fascinating that they were developing a system in which you could Free, some of them freed their own parents, some of them freed themselves, and then they owned their own property and they taught them how to take care of money, how to read. They taught them a, a, a love for God. They taught them how to run their own businesses. And so that part of history we don't know about, and I think it's really empowering to tell the whole truth, the, whole, the complete truth. What is the timeline of the events of this story? So the, the play takes place in 1836, but it covers uh, about a decade. Uh, it, it covers the period in which Napoleon sold the Louisiana territories to the United States, and it also covers the moment in which this system, this system of plassage, was dismantled. And so you can see how these uh, free people of color, how their way of life was no more, and a lot of them were afraid that they were going to be sold into slavery as well. Who dismantled plassage? The, the, the system of plassage was dismantled by the United States government in 1836, particularly because they didn't like the idea of African American women having power. They didn't like that. That was very threatening to them. And they also didn't like the idea of that these black women were in uh, what, what people considered okay relationships with white men. And so they wanted to dismantle that completely. And so a lot of the free people of color fled to France because of that. When you mentioned France, I remember the first time I visited Paris, my jaw dropped because I did not know New Orleans was such a replication of Paris. Absolutely. And here I am, born and raised in Louisiana, had gone to New Orleans all these times, but to see it in front of me, mm -hmm. to see that it had, you could just scoop it out. That's right. And that's what you saw. That's right. Absolutely. Oh my goodness. Based in truth, as we've said, and you shared some unnerving truth, <laughs> as you said, do you see a correlation in today's economic metric, when we look at black women, women of color, successful women, do any comparisons come to mind? Oh, that's such a beautiful question. So when you look at this play and look at the economical, there's an economical narrative about these women and how they ran their businesses and, and how they took care of one another. I actually see how that is passed down in today's you know, African-American women and the strong sense of of uh, values that they instill in their daughters and in each other. And so um, my mother was a huge advocate. You know, when we were growing up, she, we didn't, there wasn't an option whether you were gonna go to college or not. It was which college, <laughs> you know? And there, okay, and there, there wasn't an option of if you were gonna be somebody, you were somebody. And so, you know, some of my friends I was growing up with, you know, and they were saying, well, I don't know if I'm gonna go to college. I was like, you have an option? <laughs> That's an option to you? And I thought, you have, you have to have in education, you have to have a desire to do something. My mother used to say, even if your desire is you want to be a janitor, be the best janitor in the country. And so what I love about this period is that you see women instilling their daughters a sense of value, but also that you can be anything, that you can do anything that you set your mind to. And I see it in the African women today, and it makes me very proud. And African-American men. It's something that we have to continue to instill in each other. You know, you're touching my heart because I believe you walk and live in your destiny and I'm just returning from visiting my 94-year-old mother wow. who still inspires me. Yes. And when she tells me she's proud of me, 
she's proud of the strength and she's proud of the fortitude. And to hear you echo that, it's just, it's, it's making me a little emotional. Thank you, thank you so much. You are a native son calling Oakland, California your home. It would appear, however, that you belong to the world as it were. Your acumen, your story palette, your import, all vast. Wow. How do you define Marcus Gardley? I define Marcus Gardley as a writer who was born and bred on the, in Oakland, California. I'm going to always be an Oakland um, native son with roots in New Orleans. And so um, I do, it's always been a passion of mine to tell national stories. I definitely want my stories told all over the country, but this is always gonna be home and I'm very proud of my, where I come from. I also love where I live in Harlem. And so, you know, growing up reading all these stories about Harlem, reading Maxine Hong Kingston's work, you know, she writes about Oakland a lot. And so all these places feel like home to me. I feel like um, I, my imagination is vast and the stories that I tell are vast and I like to have a home in different pockets of the country, so yeah. Often people hear about their lives in retrospect, told usually by others who admire and appreciate them. At this tender age of early 30s, <laughs> you are receiving awards one right behind the other. How do you interpret the appreciation for you and your work. I'm very grateful for all the awards that I've won. I'm, I'm, I love being honored and I, I really feel like I've come to a place in my career where um, people, a lot of people know me and my work is very successful. The most important thing that I have found um, as being a writer, the, most, the thing that I love the most is when people come to talk to me after this show and how it touches them. And I really am, I, I want my work to be about healing and I want my work to start a conversation amongst the audience about histories and stories that we no longer know, about things that are taboo. I think if theater cannot cause a spark to change a life, then why do it? And so for me, it's all about change. It's all about starting a conversation. It's all about healing our communities. You know, when I saw my first play, which was um, The Darker Side of the Earth, written by Rita Dove, I didn't know you could write poetry on stage. No one, I'd never seen a play like that, you know, or a play period. And so I decided that story touched me in such a deep way. And it, it was an adaptation of Oedipus. And it touched me in such a deep way because I saw my story in the context of another story. And I said, I got to do this. I, gotta, I knew I had stories in me. I said, I got to tell these stories. That's why, I'm, that's why I'm put on the earth. So. Often people romanticize writers. Yeah. And they think that you live um, a life beyond the clouds. It's not always glorified. But it is compelling. What compels you most about being a writer? What compels me most about being a writer is I love the actual practice of writing. For me, it's very therapeutic. So I write every single day. I must. I get up. I write. Before I go to bed, I write. And it calms me down. You know, if I don't write before I go to bed, I actually can't sleep very well. So it actually calms me down, and I feel like that, you know, they say when you sleep, you know, your organs recharge. For me, writing, my brain recharges. And for me, it's a spiritual practice. And so I feel like in my blood and in my bones, there are the voices of the ancestors. And this is the time that they speak to me. So it's, I feel so honored that they've chosen me to speak through. Thank you for speaking to me. It has been a joy. <laughs> it has been my honor. Thank you for the beautiful questions. Absolutely.